So, we're in back, but we're in the second week of the summer at the school. And uh, in this morning, we are going to have a couple of talks. That will be a tutorial, then we'll have a seminar. And then there will be a presentation by the students that uh, have a poster to be on display this week. Uh, so, let's we'll start with the tutorial. The tutorial is going to be given by David Sanchez, who is a researcher mm -hmm. at FISC, and he has been working a lot on nanosystems and nanoscience and systems, small systems, and really focusing on transport on these systems, properties of electrons and so on. So, David. Thank you for the presentation. So, um, so my name is David Sanchez from the Institute, uh, from the FISC Institute. So this school is about uh, statistical physics of complex and small systems. So today I'm going to discuss about small systems. So there will be uh, basically a tutorial. So it means that uh, I will show you mainly pictures, okay, very few formulas. Okay, maybe the second half of my talk will show you some formulas, but not very complicated. I, mean, I think the most difficult one is algebraic uh, matrix. So it's not, uh, anyway, of course, you can uh, interrupt me. And, Ask me questions uh, if you want to know so. Okay, so uh, in general, um, okay, nanotechnology is it's a huge area. Okay, it uh, tries to control the matter at an atomic scale. Okay, so uh, people say that uh, nanotechnology can be one of the, let's say, uh, possible next industrial revolution. Because the, the, the systems that they use and the applications and the new functionality that are proposed, um, I can I'm kind of uh, try to, uh, to make a revolution in the next uh, uh, in the next decades. Um, the true thing is that uh, in many countries, people are investing a lot of money in this uh, in this technology. Okay. For instance, uh, in Europe, uh, in, uh, in this time range of uh, six, uh, seven years, um, they, they are multiplied by five, right? A factor, factor of five to the, uh, from these 200 million to one uh, liter euro, okay? So this is quite common in, in all other Western countries, uh, also the US and, and Japan, right? So even though you don't like, uh, you may, uh, of like uh, nanotechnology, you are spending money. Your government is spending money in nanotechnology. Okay, now around three, four, five euros per person per year in, in, in nano things, and of course that means that uh, we have produced a lot of knowledge in this field. Okay, first in terms of uh, publications and also in terms of patents. Okay, so in terms of publication, Europe is uh, the leading um, area in the world uh, in terms of patents. As expected, uh, the U.S. for producers more more applications. Uh, the, uh, so this is, I mean, people are spending money um, in this field not not because uh, it's, it's it's a fashion field because you know, they really uh, believe that this is is really uh, an important area of research. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, respect to years, that is here 2008, 2009, 2010. So you see, even though uh, here we have our um, friend, the crisis, um, the, the money spent or the budget for nano things are still roughly the same. So there are still people, uh, the governments are quite interested in, uh, in this field. Um, in terms of uh, publications, well, there is a huge increase since the, the 90s in all uh, industrial um, parts of the world. And um, so a little bit of history, the, probably the, let's say, uh, the, the birth of the, the birth date of nanotechnology, people say, uh, took place in the, the late 50s during a conference uh, at the California Institute of Technology by uh, Richard Feynman, in which uh, he proposed to use uh, what, what he called a lot of room that we have in the world. Okay? So this means that 
Um, at that time, uh, physics was uh, mainly dominated by uh, either atomic and nuclear physics or astrophysics and uh, large scale uh, facilities. <coughs> However, Feynman drew our attention to the fact that there were a few orders of magnitude in terms of level scales which were not, uh, let's say, taken into account properly, and there were a lot of opportunities there. Okay? In particular, if you now read your conference, the, the, this conference, which is now um, publicly available in the, in the internet, you could find that many of the ideas contained in this uh, paper um, that uh, somehow people have been able to, 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 to put it into practice in the, in, in, in the lab. Uh, for instance, he used to talk about uh, atom arrangement. People know how to do that. They, he also suggested tiny motors. They're also, I mean, not very tiny, but still there are motors at the micro scale. Uh, he uh, somehow demanded better microscopies <coughs> for, this, for this field. Now we have uh, very powerful microscopies. Computer miniaturization, since the late uh, 80s or early 90s, there is now a huge field in quantum computation. The only thing which is still people uh, have not been able to, let's say, uh, build or fabricate is these nanobots. Okay, it's just a, a matter of time. Now, nanotechnology, the, the range of, uh, let's say, focus uh, has some borders which are kind of diffuse. Okay, so they are not the strict borders. So it means that. Um, uh, on the, uh, on the one hand, we have, uh, let's say, all the length scales dominated by uh, bio things, biology, like uh, animal cells, bacteria, etc. So all of them are larger than one micron. And then we have all the atomic scales, which are smaller than one astron. Okay? So we have here like three, four orders of magnitude, which are typically go from 1 to 100 or 500 nanometers. Okay? So these are the typical size of uh, nanosystems. Okay. So when uh, Dr. Feynman talked about the bottom, so he meant all this bottom, okay? all this room, uh, which now we can play with. Okay. Now, of course, chemists know how to, how to deal with this uh, range or this order of magnitude, right? Because uh, chemists know how to build or synthesize molecules <coughs> from one nanometer, big molecules like proteins, colloidal, etc. in this range, right? But now, the, let's say, the crucial difference is that now we can build artificial structures, okay? And that's what, what we call um, structures. Okay, there is a uh, whole philosophy beyond this, um, let's say, uh, nano field, right? So, um, all the present technology is mainly based on a top-down top -down approach. Okay, this is taking on this model from the chemist. <coughs> so you, you start from some substance, some tree or whatever, and then you cut it into pieces, you analyze, and from that you know what are the building blocks. Now, the bio uh, approach is different. Okay, so you start from, it's, it's, people say this, this is a bottom-up approach. Okay, so you, 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 you really want to analyze very carefully what the building blocks are and from there try to couple all of them to try to build a new system with new functionality. Okay? So this is typically what nature does. Okay? So she starts from amino uh, acids, then she builds some um, proteins and by the end of the day adding new degrees of uh, complexity we arrive at life. So all the ideas that uh, I'm kind of uh, briefly discussing here are taken from physicists, okay? The, the main idea by uh, Richard Feynman, chemistry, all these big molecules, okay, polymers and so on. Uh, of course, uh, by biologists. And if we want to do some, some applications, then of course we need engineers, okay? So that means that nanoscience in, ge in general is interdisciplinary, okay? So it means that you can find physicists working in nanoscience, or you can find uh, biologists uh, working in, in nanoscience. Okay? Ideally, all of them should work together okay, to produce new things. But OK, this is uh, something more 
Okay, so I will here mainly focus on uh, the physics point of view, okay, on the physics side of uh, nanotechnology. Okay, so uh, probably the most uh, spectacular um, achievement in nanotechnology is that uh, nowadays we are able to see that it's okay, something that people were skeptical about in the uh, last century. So we are now with uh, <coughs> with uh, good microscopes. We are there able to, to see atoms, not only to see atoms, but we are able to take one atom and to move it around. Okay. Now to do so, we need, uh, as I said, uh, good tools, okay? And uh, typical optical uh, microscopy is not good, okay? Because in the visible uh, range uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum, this means that we have uh, around 500 nanometers, and there are these very big photons, okay? So as, uh, as I said, uh, nano systems live between one, uh, and then the region between lead one and 0.1 and uh, 500 nanometers, so we are here, let's say, in one border, so this is not good, okay? So there is a rule in physics, so you probably learned uh, about this in college, that uh, if, we, if you want to, to have a good spatial revolution or uh, spatial uh, resolution, so you need that your probe, okay, the way from the probe should be on the same order, okay. So we need a probe with of the order of let's say one, ten, one hundred nanometers, okay. So the first uh, people first try with electron microscopy, okay. You know that the electrons are not only particles they're waves, okay. And then a uh, typical uh, wavelength for electrons is like 10, 10 nanometers, okay? So this is good, we can use this. The problem is that, of course, to um, manipulate electrons, we need high voltages, okay? And these um, uh, systems or, let's say, these devices are restricted to metallic samples, okay? So forget about bio uh, to, to, to check uh, biology, uh, uh, systems, uh, DNA, whatever. So you, you cannot uh, uh, address, uh, you can study these systems with this uh, kind of microscopy. Now the um, big step came with uh, Rohr and Binnick, which uh, they um, were awarded by the, uh, the, uh, with the Nobel Prize. They invented scanning probe microscopy. So there are basically two types of uh, uh, scanning microscopy, STM and AFM. They can reach really, really small or very, very good uh, resolution. Now, this is the first one, okay? Scanning tiny microscopy, or briefly STM, works as follows. So, uh, you have to have a tip, okay? Typically, it's uh, a metallic tip, which is very, very thin, okay? So, ideally, this uh, finishes with just one or two atoms. So, it's just really, really, really uh, narrow tip. Now here you have your sample, okay? So your sample consists of atoms, okay? So if the, uh, if the atoms sit in these positions, then you will have, let's say, more electrons here and here than in the middle, okay? These are, let's say, regular crystal, okay? Now, uh, what, what, what do you do now? Now, uh, you apply a voltage between the tip at the surface, okay? So electrons can now go from the tip to the, sur to the surface, okay? The problem is that here you have vacuum, okay? <coughs> but it doesn't matter because uh, if you, um, let's say, put your uh, tip very close to the, to the surface, so the electrons use, using quantum me uh, mechanical tunnel effect can go through the tip to the sample, okay? So you measure current. Now, current is proportional to the density of the states in the tip and the density of the states in your sample. The density of the states in the tip is something that you know because you built it, okay? And the density of the states in your sample is, a, is something that you want to, to, to know, okay? So from a current measurement, you can actually uh, uh, map, okay, uh, the density of the states in a surface, which of course is going to be higher in those positions where atomic, uh, where, where atoms uh, really are addressed. Okay, so you understand this, right? So this is 
you only transport uh, measurement, so you apply a voltage, and from the current uh, voltage characteristics, you are able to map all the atomic structure. Okay. Of course, for that, you need an example that's really metallic. After STM, people invented atomic force uh, microscopy. Okay, the good thing about uh, this microscopy is not restricted to metallic samples. Okay, so you can put here some scraper or some uh, DNA, whatever you like. Okay? Now you, you cannot use uh, current measurement. So what do you use? Uh, you put the same thing, okay, but you attach it to a cantilever. Now the cantilever is flexible. Okay, so you can move up and down. Okay, so you scan all your surface, okay, and the, the position of the tip, okay, I mean the vertical position of the tip, which before in the STM was fixed, now it can just move up and down, up and down, okay. Now this position, um, this vertical position is recorded by this laser, okay, just by making typical uh, interference, okay. Um, and from, um, from the tip, from the vertical position of this tip, you can actually map all these uh, all the okay? Not only that, but you cannot actually, you can go with your tip, okay? Touch the surface, lift the tip, and then take this atom and move it around, okay? And this is actually what they did in the um, Amadeus group in, in IBM, okay? They were able to write uh, these um, letters with uh, single atoms. Okay, they are really single atoms. So this is really the ultimate uh, spatial resolution in terms of writing. Uh, okay, of course, this is funny, but uh, we can do. We, we would like to have some physics, and uh, the same group uh, years after they were able to construct a quantum coral. So they are these are atoms in a metallic surface. And here you can find, this is like ellipse, right? So in the, in this locky of this uh, ellipse, so you can find different tips, different, let's say, heights in a, in a kind of uh, modulated uh, surface. So these are electron waves. So we can see the atoms and across with this, uh, with this kind of uh, techniques. Uh, so before we wanted to, let's say, uh, see the atoms or see the surface, but of course we would like to also to build new surfaces and build new, new, new systems. Probably the most popular technique is, uh, is called uh, lithography. Okay? So you have an electron beam with, a, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, let's say, large energy, and then you are able to, in these areas, to remove all the material. Right? So the width of these uh, little channels that you construct is of the order of a few nanometers. So an electron can just arrive at this ring and then make a wave interference. It's like a Fabi Perot or sorry, uh, like a Jung uh, experiment. It's exactly the same. Okay. But now we can do it with uh, artificial, artificial samples. You can also uh, construct tiny uh, um, motors. Okay, as suggested by Feynman, okay, this is a, like a wheel, and here for comparison they put, let's say, a uh, blood cell. So it's really very, very small. It's not nano because it's not the other of microns, but it's still uh, a, a tiny, tiny object. So what kind of uh, materials um, can we use in, in this field? So um, the first uh, family is based on carbon. Okay? So as you know, in nature we have uh, two um, types of carbon, diamond and graphite. Okay, this is diamond, this is graphite. But uh, it's more, much more exciting uh, to have uh, new structures, okay? Now, um, this uh, gentleman here received the Nobel Prize because they were able to just uh, have one single layer of, uh, of graphite, which they call graphene. Okay, and uh, apparently so far is the strongest material. Electrons uh, move uh, very quickly here, but the fantastic, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, property of this material is that at very low energies, electrons behave as uh, they have normal masses. So 
they are derived from those. Okay. This is the first pure uh, two-dimensional object okay, that we have in nature because the width of this object is just one atom. Okay. And uh, if we now want to go to the 1D regime, what, what you can do is just take one graphene layer and fold it around. Okay, so you, you, you will build one of these uh, nanotubes, okay, which is just a long tube, um, which now properties uh, change very much depending on how you run your, your system. Okay, and the next, uh, sorry, the next step, of course, is COD. Okay, COD means that effectively all your system is confined in three directions. Okay. So this is uh, what people call a buckyball or a C60 because it's made of uh, 60 carbon atoms. Okay, it has the shape of um, of a football, right? Like here. Okay, and then to see the differences, I mean, to have uh, an idea of the um, let's say length scale. Okay, uh, you see from here to here we have to multiply by 10 to the 8, and to go from the buckyball back to the the football we, we need uh, another 10 to the 8. Okay? So there is a lot of room here okay, in this world that we have to we would like to explore. Okay, this is an, uh, a different um, kind of system. These are called semiconductor infrastructures. They are not based on, on carbon atoms. So here you take two semiconductors with different guts, okay? You put it together and then you construct uh, um, energy diagrams like this one, okay? You have here a potential step, like in what, what you have in quantum mechanics, okay? Now, at this potential step, it is possible to show that, be, that electrons um, behave as, true, uh, as effectively as, as in 2D system. Okay? This, people call this two dimensional uh, electron gas. So, two dimensional electron gas will be formed typically between uh, aluminum gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide. It's not the only semiconductors that uh, you can use here. You can use different semiconductors, but these are quite, uh, quite, quite useful, okay? Now, uh, you have this uh, two-dimensional electron gas, and due to a technique, which is one of the most useful, useful techniques in nanotechnology, which was invented by Dinger and Stormer. Stormer. Stormer received the prize for something else. But they invented uh, remote doping which means that you can dope, you know, semiconductors are good because you can dope them, okay? So you can dope here, uh, semiconductors have all the electrons, uh, all the excess electrons that you're putting into the system just go to the two-dimensional electron gas, okay? So this means that these uh, electron gases will have a very, very high mobility, okay? Because all the impurities are just far away, okay, from this interface, okay? So electrons live like a flat, okay, and very, very, very little uh, scattering. Can you uh, repeat what is that? Meant? Because I, I didn't understand the big ass thing. Yes. So here uh, you, have, you have a bound state because you have this band bending. Okay. Now electrons go here. Okay. So typically, if you dope close to this interface, uh, yeah, elect you, you will also have a two-dimensional electron gas, right? But uh, you have, uh, let's say, let's say ionized impurities, okay? So you have Coulomb interaction between the electrons and the impurities, and this reduces mobility out, okay? But due to this, I mean, the nice thing about uh, this remote doping is that you put your atoms, your, let's say, your dopants far away from the interface, okay? So electrons just uh, travel here, okay? They're bound, bound here in these uh, two-dimensional electron gases, and all the ionized impurities are far away. By the way, it means uh, a few hundred nanometers. Okay. okay, so we can do now nanoelectronics with these systems. Okay? So the typical thing is to try to mimic this uh, field effect transistor okay, invented by Bardeen and colleagues in Bell Labs. So uh, basically, what we have in a, in a transistor is that you have two contacts, the source, the drain. These are just like reservoirs, electronic reservoirs. And then you want to move your electrons from here to here, okay? These are kind of um, insulator layer. 
And the key point of, the, of a feed effect transistor is this gate, this gate terminal. Okay? By applying a, a potential to this gate, to this uh, gate potential, um, to this gate contact, you are able to switch on and off the current between the source and the drain. Okay? And then you have this uh, two current um, um, now, the typical size of these uh, systems now is decreasing with time. Okay? So, the typical size, uh, so the, the distance between, let's say, the source of the drain or the, the size of the gate, which is uh, actually which fixes the, the, the length of uh, a field effect transistor, is, is decreasing with, uh, with time. And then, of course, this is good because you can put more transistors in the same chip. Okay? But the bad news is that, well, there are very bad news, but probably uh, one of the worst news is that uh, this produces a lot of heat and you have to dissipate the heat. Okay? So there is a limit. You cannot just reduce forever. Okay? At some point, uh, your chip starts to. Hotter and hotter, and then of course it's not reliable because it will just break down. Okay. So one possibility is to use, to use uh, nano transistors. Okay. Okay, but this is uh, good for engineers. Okay, for from the physics point of view, uh, there is a system which is very close to to feed to feed effect transistor. Okay, and uh, instead of using uh, let's say this, instead of using this uh, silicon thing, okay, we use our previous uh, gallium arsenide uh, two-dimensional electron gas, which is here, okay, and we build the, the same structure. So we put a source, we put a drain, and we put a contact in the middle, okay. Now electrons live here, they move in this plane, okay. Now if you apply a voltage between the source and the drain, electrons will try to move from the left to the right. Okay? But here we put a gate. Okay? Now we apply an, 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 an electric field and this works like a capacitor. So it will remove all electrons okay, from this area beneath the, the gate. Okay? And then here we will have just a very, very small constriction. So all electrons which want to go from the source to the drain will have to pass through this constriction. Now, this constriction has the size of a Fermi wavelength. So it's really, really small, on the order of a few nanometers. For a semiconductor, this is on the order of a, of a Fermi wavelength. So this means that here we will see quantum effects, just by, by, by changing the, this field of tension. Now, there are different regimes that we can consider. This is the classical regime. Okay? If the sample is not very good, then we will have a lot of impurities here in the channel in the constriction, and then electrons just follow some Drude theory, okay? That's all. So we will see some classical conductance, no problem. Now the really interesting thing, or uh, the, the, the quantum regime appears here in the ballistic case, okay? In the ballistic case, the, 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 the sample is so good, okay? There are so, so few impurities here that electrons go through this channel just by banding around with the walls of the other channel, okay? So we have here, uh, as I said, a channel with a wave of, of the order of Fermi wavelength, so we'll see here confinement effects. So electrons behave here as waves, okay? So they keep the phase coherence through going um, along this channel, okay? Uh, these systems are called quantum point contacts. They're probably the most simple system we have in our electronics. Okay. Now, this is not theoretical. This is experimental. Okay. Now, people can actually see how electrons flow from the left to the right or to or this constriction. Okay. Now, there are two important things about this um, nice uh, picture. First of all, you see that uh, this is basically the wave function. Okay. Square of the wave function. So we have electrons which are picked here, okay, these regions, 
and the wave function is here in between. So we have we are seeing here the nodes of the wave function. This is a pure confined effect. Okay? We have a confinement potential, the wave functions, you know, depending on the, the state. Okay, so you can observe uh, nodes or zeros in the wave function. This is also very interesting, this part over here, because you see this wiggle here, this is just now wave interference effects. Okay, so electrons behave as waves. Okay, so we have Let's say the two main uh, quantum uh, effects, confinement and interference. OK, now I want to show you some formulas. Okay. Uh, how to deal with this? Okay. Uh, this is our constriction. Okay, So we have uh, our, let's say, left reservoir, right reservoir. All states are filled up to Fermi energy, U. Okay. And for simplicity, we consider zero temperature. Now, as I said, we have to apply a voltage between left and right. Okay, this is our V here. Okay. Now, uh, suppose that the voltage we apply is very, very small. Okay, to, to, to be in the linear response regime. So we have just a few electrons, which can tunnel through the constriction, or which can go through the constriction either by uh, tunnel effect or whatever. Okay. Now, there's one possibility that the electron just uh, tunnel, go through the constriction T, another one which is reflected. Now, suppose I don't know anything about quantum mechanics, but I know from uh, electro, uh, 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 the course of uh, uh, electric fields, magnetic fields, that the current is given by charge times velocity times density. Okay, this is purely classical expression. Okay, now density is given by the density. This is the density of the electrons, which which are let's say a little bit above the Fermi energy because the, the other ones do not contribute to current. Okay. Now, those electrons uh, about the Fermi energy, the density is given by the density of the states times the energy range, okay? which is just the voltage times charge. Okay? That's, that's our density. However, this is a purely 1D channel. Okay? As I showed you here before, this behaves basically as 1D. And 1D, the density of the states, you remember from solid state physics goes as the square root of energy. Okay? And this is basically the velocity. So this density of states, which goes as the velocity, cancels with this uh, Fermi velocity here. Okay? Now this cancellation means that the current becomes a universal function. So whatever material you put here, due to this cancellation, the current is going to be given by E squared over H times voltage. Okay? Now, here I assume that all electrons which are coming from the left are right at the, at the right. Okay? At the right electrode. But suppose that there is a transmission probability. Well, it doesn't matter. We can multiply this with a transmission probability. And from there, we have that the conductance is given by E squared times H times the transmission probability. This suggests that uh, with nanomaterials or with nanoelectronics, we have to make a quantum mechanical calculation to find what is the conductance, which is a physical magnitude, okay, which we measure with uh, classical uh, machines. Okay. Now, what is the order of this uh, E squared over H? Well, probably we are more used to thinking about resistances instead of uh, conductances. Okay? The uh, inverse of this resistance is H over E squared, which is of the order of 24 kilo ohms. Okay? In other words, this E squared over H is the maximum conductance that a given mode can support. Okay? So this is like, like, like a maximum. No uh, you have a um, perfect transmitting um, um, electronic channel, okay? The conductance is going to be given by E squared over H, and no more than that, okay? Or in other words, a perfectly transmitting channel has a minimum resistance of H over E squared. This is very important because one would think that a perfectly transmitted channel would have zero resistance. And it's not true. <coughs> okay? So it has 
Now, in the late 80s, uh, the groups of Delft and Cambridge, they were able to measure the conductance as a function of this gate voltage. Remember that this gate is somehow um, controlling the, con the constriction. Okay? So by changing this gate voltage, you can open or close this constriction in the two-dimensional electron gas. So electrons go from here to here with a very, very small voltage. Okay? You measure conductance. Okay? So you measure your, your current. You know your voltage. You have uh, conductance over voltage. And then you plot conductance as a function of this constriction. Okay? So here, increasing the gate voltage means that you are opening the constriction more and more. Okay? And you see, they obtain this nice conductance condensation. <coughs> okay? So in terms of uh, 2 e squared over h. Before I said that the conductance was given by e squared over h is universal. Okay? Of course, each channel has two spins, spin up, spin down, we have further inertia. Okay? So that's why we have in the experimental data, that's why we have for 2 e squared over h. Now, uh, this uh, conductance quantization appears because the conductance is given by the transmission. So whenever we have transmission equal 1, it means that we are opening a new channel. Okay? So we have a new channel transmitting, then there is a jump in the conductance. And then we have another plateau, and so on and so on. Okay? Let's say the first relevant result is this view. Now, um, what happens now? We increase temperature. Then we know that temperature kills quantum mechanical effects uh, in general, and then this conductance quantization is washed out. Okay, when we increase the temperature. So all experiments in nanoelectronics take place at very low temperature. Okay, well, no, not very low. Of the order of uh, uh, 100 millikelvin to be calculated. Okay, so uh, we need to formulate a model, a theory, which takes into account the transmission probability okay, through this constriction. Okay. So the most popular model is called the scattering approach. Okay. Now. Um, Scattering and the scattering approach considers independent electrons, okay, which are preparing some uh, incident state, okay, some plane waves, okay, and now uh, we have to calculate the reflection amplitude and the transmission amplitude to, through some constriction. You can have a constriction like a, like like in a quantum point contact, or you can have more complicated structures. Okay, here I have a very very simple tunnel diagram. But in general, you have some more complicated scattering potentials. So everything in this model is reduced to calculating the scattering matrix. Okay? All these numbers that we have here are complex, number, complex numbers are given in terms of reflection and transmission amplitudes from the left, when we are solving the problem from the left, or transmission T prime and R prime if we are calculating from everything from the right. Okay? Now, these waves here are just the incident, the, let's say, the ingoing waves or the outgoing waves. Okay, it doesn't matter. You have to calculate this uh, transmission and reflection probabilities. Okay? With this, we will be able to calculate the conductance okay? and the current. Okay? Now, in general, due to current conservation, there is a nice property, uh, namely, the scattering matrix is, uh, is unitary. So this actually, this T and T prime, they are uh, connected uh, to each other, and of course the reflection plus transmission should be equal to one. So there are some constraints to the way we build these uh, scattering matrices. But in any case, we have to do this for any uh, conductance. Now it's possible now to understand better the conductance quantization in quantum point contacts. Now we have. Yeah, again, the two uh, electronic reservoirs with a voltage difference applied between them. Here we have a one-dimensional electron wave guide. Okay? So it is possible to show that the uh, electron spectrum of this channel is given by these parabolas, just uh, free electrons. Okay? 
Okay. Each of these parabola is, is, is one uh, electron, electronic mode, electronic channel. And then the conductance is going to be given by E squared over H, okay, the universal conductance quantum, times the sum of the transmission probabilities. Now, whenever an electron has energy above one of these thresholds, it will contribute with E squared over H. So these transmissions are just step functions, okay? And the sum of this step function is just the number of electrons, sorry, of uh, modes that we have opened at a given gate voltage in our constriction, okay? And then, um, as a consequence, the conductance is given by these two e, e squared over h times um, n, where these two, of course, as I said, um, appears because, because we have to spin the generation. If we have other degeneracies in our system due to symmetry, for instance, a carbon nanotube has a degeneracy of four, then the conductance shows these four e squared over h. So we can actually learn a lot of things from the from a carbon measurement, from a conductance measurement. Yeah, we have quantum point contact. What happens now if we put two quantum point contacts in a series? Actually, in this experiment, there are three of them. But OK, suppose that we neglect like this one. So we have one quantum point contact here, one point quantum point contact here. Electrons come from here, OK? Go through this constriction. And then the region in between is like a cavity. OK, electrons just uh, are confined in this cavity, and after multiple reflections, it will go out. So what will be the conductance associated to this uh, structure? Well, we know that if we have one um, quantum point contact, the conductance is E squared over H times the number of modes. Then if we have two conductance, sorry, two uh, QPCs, uh, quantum point contacts in a series, then we have to add resistances. Okay, like in a circuit. Or for the conductance, we have to add 1 over j, j over 1, plus 1 over j2. Okay, that will be the total, the total conductance. So one would expect to have E squared over H times M, which is the total number of modes, the sum of here, the modes here and here, divided by 4. That will be our, let's say, classical expectation. However, in the experiment, they don't see this. They say, um, well, this is exactly this M over 4, okay? But written in terms of M1 and 2, okay? They see this, okay? Plus a correction, okay? Now, this correction goes as 1 over M, okay? So it vanishes in the limit of a large number of modes. So it's a pure quantum correction, okay? This correction appears because electrons here, um, there's a phenomenon which is called weak localization. So electrons, due to wave interference, they have a little bit more probability of being reflected than being transmitted. Okay? And that's why here we have a minus. Okay? And you can, have, you can uh, uh, formulate a random matrix theory for these kind of systems. And that's why they call uh, this system are called chaotic cavity. Because in the uh, classical regime, these electrons behave as, uh, they, they have a classical lag. Uh, sorry, a chaotic lag. Well, depending on the on the shape of the the cavity, right? The yes, yes, yes. Shapes are chaotic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm, I'm considering the case where this is quite a right one. Yes, if you're right. Okay, so I will finish uh, this uh, tutorial with uh, a mention to, to noise. Okay, because <coughs> these kind of systems you can um, you can consider. I mean. We have been focused only on the conductance, on the current, on the mean conductance, right? But um, um, the, the electronic population also fluctuates with time, okay? So, um, and they fluctuate with time uh, because, okay, there are basically two sources of noise in these systems, okay? Uh, and the two, two sources uh, are in intrinsic noise, okay? So the first one is, uh, Related to the half, to, to the to, to the fact that that you have a uh, finite temperature, okay? At zero temperature, of course, these two reservoirs are noiseless sources, okay? Because all the electrons are just occupying the same uh, states. But if you have a finite temperature, then 
uh, there is thermally excited electrons, okay, and this produces thermal noise, okay, and this is uh, this is given by this uh, electronic uh, density, okay, which is basically the Fermi distribution function times one on one minus alpha, okay. This is nothing else but uh, Johnson lightning okay, which uh, electronic engineers know since 100 years ago. So this is like classical noise, if you wish. Now, suppose that we are at zero temperature. So this noise is zero, OK? But at zero temperature, there is a quantum mechanical noise. Why? Because this electron can now tunnel through the barrier for being reflected. And this produces fluctuations in the occupation. Because now the, the, the mean occupation, let's say, in the transmitted channel is going to be given by the transmission probability that this changes. Okay. So this uh, new source of noise is proportional to transmission times 1 minus transmission. So it's maximal for when the transmission is 1 half, 50%, okay? because this is the largest uncertainty in your system. This is actually called shock noise, okay? because it's uh, similar to the noise that uh, Schottky uh, discovered in a, in a vacuum tube. Okay, so uh, in this uh, uh, very old experiment, um, Schottky, uh, uh, he was able to heat this um, reservoir of electrons, basically it's a reservoir of electrons, and then electrons by thermoionic uh, thermo um, uh, fusion or emission, it emits electrons, okay? But the probability to emit one electron is very small, so it obeys Poissonian statistics. Okay? And so uh, he was able to show that the noise of the detected current is proportional to the mean current itself, like in uh, Poissonian statistics. Okay? And this is basically what you have in, in, in also in the quantum regime. Okay? In the quantum regime, you also have the, the uh, noise or the fluctuations associated to the transmission channel is proportional to the current itself. Okay? There is, of course, this correction, 1 minus t, but when the, the transmission is very slow, you recover the short use. Okay, so this is a, a very nice uh, connection between quantum and classical systems. Okay. And then, um, because you can calculate the noise, this has been measured, the noise of a, of a quantum point contact. The conductance, you remember, was perfectly quantized for some gate okay, voltages, okay? And the noise, of course, went. The electrons pass through the constriction, the transmission is one, and the shot noise is zero. The shot noise is maximum only in the transmission in the transitions between two patterns. Okay, conclusions. So I will just um, briefly discuss say quantum transfer in small conductors or small systems. Okay. I hope I convince you that this is a very hot topic. Okay, there are many people working in this area, and generally in, in nanoscience and uh, nanoconductors. I have discussed only one theoretical formalist, namely the scattering approach, okay, which considers that the electrons, assumes that the electrons are just independent particles. They don't see each other, they do not interact with each other, okay, and also. Uh, they do not uh, suffer from decoherence, dissipation, and all these uh, nasty things that we have in real life. Okay? Now, how do we deal with uh, strong interactions? Okay, for that we need to formulate more microscopic theory, really, uh, let's say, consider that your problem is a many body problem, and for that you need another kind of techniques, which the, name of the next speaker will explain you after the coffee break. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in my take home message, I'd like to uh, understand more uh, heat. Uh, because you announced that it's much better, this solution is much better in terms of heat production. This is at least what I understood. But then I didn't understand the mechanism why it's so better. Yes. So, uh, let me see. This is a very difficult um, problem. The point is that, um, let me see.
I mean, comparing to, to classical. Yes. I mean, the problem is, is that when you, let's say, reduce the size of the system more and more, okay, so we'll dissipate more. So we, we, because you have the same, let's say, currents, okay, in the in well, you have a larger number of currents, but uh, confined over in a smaller region. Okay. So we know very naive that the heat and the joule heating is going to be given by current and voltage. Okay. So it will, it will increase. Okay. Now. Um, in the, this constriction, for instance, the length of this constriction is typically much smaller than the dissipation length or the inelastic scattering length. So all, uh, let's say, energy dissipation takes place far away from this region, never here. Okay. This is one thing. The second thing is that these experiments are usually um, uh, they form at very low temperatures. Okay. So the main source of dissipation is many forms. Very low temperature forms of play all over the world. Okay. Of course, from the practical point of view, you want something which works at room temperature. Okay. For this, uh, there are different, let's say, proposals. One, one which I didn't discuss here is to use not the electronic or the sorry, sorry the charge degree of field, but the spin degree of field. Okay. This is a whole new area, which is called spintronics. Right. And in this field, it is possible to reduce the power consumption. But okay, I couldn't discuss it. Of course, no. I'm not uh, into quantum mechanics, so maybe I'm asking a very stupid question. But um, in quantum effects, is it just an inevitable consequence of the size of your system? Because it's so small. Quantum effects, or do you really build them in because you think they have some uh, very useful application? Like, are you designing your structure to show some quantum effects, or is your structure so small that there is no other way than that you obtain quantum effects in its interaction? Yes, so basically, they are that you have quantum effects. Uh, First of all, as you said, because there is a, there is a size quantization effects because they are so small that actually you see uh, uh, this uh, phenomena, and also because um, the let's say the quality of the samples is so good that the coherence length is also or the decoherence length is also much larger than these 200 nanometers. So electrons they are able to let's say to show their wave uh, properties in a much uh, larger scale. So you have these two uh, two choices. Small effects and also uh, very high quality of the systems. Any other question? Okay. If now we find the David again and we move to the top of the road. That is uh, yeah, outside.